So first and foremost, if you're a bank advisor, you're comfortable in doing what you're doing, fine. But if you want freedom and flexibility to be able to communicate with clients, to be able to write them stuff, to be able to talk to them, to be able to, to not feel shackled, to not have to sit on conference calls every, you know, I, I was on conference calls, I don't know how many times a day, three or four times a day, like we're not getting enough referrals for this, or we're not doing this. And, you know, some of the top guys that have been there for 20, 25 years, their books are big enough, they don't worry about it. But I, I, I'm in the, under the belief that if you're not growing, you're dying. And I was, I was in that bank channel and I was growing, but I was also starting to get shackled by all the asks and demands. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. Um, have a fantastic guest today, Evan Mayer, CEO of Fortuna Wealth and also the host of uh, Four Advisors by Advisors podcast. Uh, it's a fantastic story of him um, leaving SunTrust Bank, now Truist, in, in 2019 to go independent with Raymond James and just has had a truly remarkable growth story that I think financial advisors really need to hear. Uh, Evan, I really appreciate the time. Yeah, no, pleasure and, and thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't mind just telling us a little bit about uh, Fort, Fortuna Wealth, um, I think it'd be really helpful for the audience. Yeah, so um, um, I was in the bank channel, you know, started in the business, uh, uh, basically in the bank channel in 2005, uh, was with two different banks. Uh, we went independent in 2019. Initially, um, you know, me and you talked on on my show actually a little, little bit ago about name recognition. Initially, I was leaving the bank channel, and when I left, I – I was the mayor group with SunTrust, so I decided to brand myself the mayor group with Raymond James uh, to kind of make that conversion easier for clients. Um, we made the conversion about two years into uh, the move to independence. Uh, we split off from our uh, super OSJ we initially signed on with and uh, created our own OSJ. And then at that same time, decided to rebrand to a name that was more encompassing of uh, our, our firm and then also didn't have like my last name on it where other advisors might feel a little weird, you know, joining uh, that have been in the business for a long time. So we changed the name to Fortuna Wealth and we love the name and the website was available for, for some cash and thought it thought it made a lot of sense uh, to to make that name change. Love it. So how long were you in the bank channel before making the transition to independence? So 2005, I started and I left in 2019. So almost 15 years. Awesome. So during that time, what were some of the things that you you really liked about the bank channel? And then maybe some of the things over time that, you know, really started to frustrate you? Yeah, my, my, my story is a little unique in that, that I started I started off as a licensed personal banker um, on the bank side. I didn't I wasn't a financial advisor about a year into uh, that I was I was crushing it. Um, and, and that was at a time we had very limited on what we could offer clients, but we were doing a lot of fixed annuities, things like that, simple, easy things um, and had the option to become a financial advisor inside the firm uh, did that. Um, was 100% transactional for probably my first three years in the business, then decided that I wanted to become fee-based, did that, made that switch in 09, uh, started to grow the practice. And then in 2012, 2011, 2012, BB&T was buying Bank Atlantic. And at the time, BB&T had two uh, divisions. They had Scott and Stringfellow and they had BB&T. And if you were in the bank channel, you were only able to take clients worth 250,000 and less. Um, and I was never in the business of just taking on clients that were worth 250,000 or less. I don't think any advisor kind of goes into their practice going, you know, I want to work with the, the, you know, the least amount of money as possible. Um, so we made the move to, to SunTrust basically brought over a small book of business that we had at that time and then grew, uh, um, you know, hugely year over year over year. I mean, we were growing by 25 to 50% year over year over year until 2019. I woke up one morning and found out that bb &T was then buying SunTrust or merging with SunTrust. And I was, I was like, Oh, maybe it's now the time to go and, and started looking around, uh, talked to many wirehouses, um, was pretty much signed to go, you know, ready to go to Morgan Stanley at the time they were offering the, the most money up front. Uh, got a last minute call to, to go out for a stake with, the um, 
the guy over at Raymond James, uh, Joe Pellegrini, who I've mentioned a, a bunch. And uh, three months later, I was independent with Raymond James. Nice. It's always steak. I, I'm going to, I'm going to switch that up, do something like a little bit different, I think, but yeah, get those trigless rides going. The advisors, you know, get that, that number really, really high and we might make some different decisions. So, <laughs> so I, I helped a lot of SunTrust advisors around your time period, make the transition, you know, over to independence. I think there was a lot of changes being made, a lot of Merrill executives coming in, you know, kind of like cutting the minimums, like we were talking about before, um, just adding a little bit like of uh, just a lot of restriction on the way that advisors could run their business. But even outside of SunTrust, I hear from advisors all the time, like Corey, I'm not getting leads from the bank anymore. I'm basically getting a bank payout, um, uh, but I'm running my business like a, like a private client group office. Like I, I need to make a change. Was that, was that your, were you getting most of your leads from the bank or were they mostly self-sourced? It's it's funny you mentioned it. So and and actually Nick Nielsen, who who was one of the people you you ended up recruiting, uh, I think he was at a point where he was not receiving the same referral flow and, and made the move. Mine was mine was a little bit different. Um, there was not many good advisors in my local area, and all the branches basically knew of me and knew I had you know huge success doing planning with clients and and, and the ability to gather those relationships and. And, and so we were very different. I would say we were very different than your average bank advisor. So um, while my practice was growing, um, you know, once we hit 100 million, 150 million, we got up to like 180, I think 185 by the time I left, um, we, were, we were growing significantly. And I was getting, you know, a, still a ton of referrals from the bank. So it was not a lack of it. And even when I was leaving, I remember my, the manager that, that was there at the time said, you know, you're making a mistake, you're getting so many referrals, why would you leave? And, and truthfully, at the time, I had already made my commitment to go. So I was going. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I was actually I was starting to get a ton of referrals from my existing clients, I did not need the referrals anymore from the bank, the referrals I was getting from my existing clients were easier to deal with, because they already knew me, they yeah. knew me as an advisor, where the referrals from the bank were more pay hey, a higher rate, you know, speak to Evan kind of situation. Um, so it was a little bit different of a of a flow. I was still getting the referrals, but I was no longer in need of them anymore. And I really wanted to spread my wings. I was, you know, at the time I was 39 years old, um, 38 actually at the time we went independent, uh, 10 days prior to my birthday. Um, and I was I was young and I was like, I wanna I I wanna be able to do podcasts, I want to be able to write articles, I want to be able to write emails to my clients, I wanted freedom more than anything at the time. Sure. That makes sense. So what is it about Raymond James that made them the right fit for you? I looked at all the other platforms and it's funny, you, you, you think these names, these established names, like Morgan Stanley to me, for whatever reason, back then, I always looked at it like that was the creme de la creme, like that, you know, that name, that, that history. My thought was they were gonna have the best tools and technologies. Um, I looked at UBS, I looked at a couple other firms, I looked at some bank channels, I, uh, you know, uh, one of my friends, who was my manager, Joe, Joe Lucini ran SunTrust at the time, uh, uh, investments for Florida, he went to Sonova. So I started looking around to everywhere. And when I went to go have that stake with Joe Lucini, uh, excuse me, Joe, Joe Pellegrini, a lot of Joe's. Um, he, he said, you know, why don't you come up to Tampa? Uh, we do this, you know, technology day where we kind of show you all the tools and technologies we have. And I went up there, uh, me and my assistant um, at the time went up there. Uh, we flew at seven in the morning. Our flights got canceled. There was like delays. We didn't actually leave the airport till two o'clock. So it got crammed. But we literally left there the next uh, uh, morning going, we need, to, we need to come here. Like the tools and technologies the technologies that Raymond James has, the amount of money they put into their, their their services and their softwares, and then the ability to use third-party software if they don't have it, uh, is so great. We were mesmerized by it, and to this day, I still look at all the tools and technologies of some of the other firms. Uh, it's still a, an elite firm as far as that's concerned. Absolutely. So. Was a big part of your decision-making process as well. Like, did you like that Raymond James had a big brand? Because very few independent firms 
have a recognized brand that, you know, somebody is going to recognize on the street. Was that an attractor to you? hundred percent. And, and I think some of that has to do with, I wasn't a fool when I went independent to go, you know, I'm just going to be able to bring all my clients. I, I was on the other side of the aisle. I was, I was, everybody says bank advisors are only able to take 50 percent you know raymond james when when they were talking with me and negotiating with me were like you know bank advisors on average do this we think you're on the high end so we're going to offer you this but it was still like hey bank advisors are going to have tough times and i don't know if that's the case i i i would say based on our practice and, and now four years out but at the time going to a big named firm like raymond james to me made the difference and so part of our you know, my scripts per se, or my conversation starters of when I was, you know, what I call D-Day, which is like the most stressful day of your life is the day you actually leave, right? Um, where you're actually making those phone calls. And to be able to say, you know, I've affiliated with Raymond James, you know who they are, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers play at Raymond James Stadium where the Super Bowl is, you know, to be able to have that f famili familiarity towards a name was huge. Um, where, you know, truth be told, LPL, I know that's a past employer you worked at, um, ha also has great tools and technologies, a, a, a very good name in the business, but how many clients actually know what, who LPL was? And the, the answer is, is most don't, most, most, most wouldn't know. So I felt comfortable making that switch to Raymond James. I don't regret it because I'm very happy here. Uh, and I have no plans on leaving. Hopefully I grow old one day and I'll still be here, but at the same time, I think name recognition when you're leaving the bank channel depends on on your your relationship situation with your clients. So you had an incredibly successful transition for for a bank advisor. Like, what would you tell bank advisors that are just kind of starting getting to that point? Like, I I, I want to spread my wings. Maybe I'm a couple years out. I don't know. Like, like what are the things that they should be doing? That's a great, it's a phenomenal question. It's something I share with bank advisors because a lot of times I'll have bank advisors that get referred to me by recruiters or, or, or they just know my name in the business and they call me and they, they you know, hey, we're, I'm interested maybe in going independent, you know, talk to me a little bit. And, and a lot of what I talk to them about is a lot of times they're not ready. And you go, well, what do you mean they're not ready? Well, I think bank advisors for the, for, 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 you know, the first thing you need to do is, is, is the last two years you're there name recognition for your personal brand needs to take over brand recognition for the, the bank. Meaning that my clients knew when they came to see me, they were coming to see Evan Mayer that happened to be at SunTrust and not going to see SunTrust that has a guy there named Evan Mayer. Um, and I think that switch is, is huge. Make sure that you know when you're writing pieces or, or emails or you're sending things to clients, that they're coming from your belief system and not necessarily just the banks. And I think too many times we're we're publicizing wherever we're at. You know, if we're at Morgan Stanley or we're at Raymond James as, as an example, we may just be sharing that data from their economists and not how you truly believe. Uh, so I think that's important. One, two, um, that you have a process with clients that that you're not just selling them product. If you're a product guy, you might just want to stay in the bank because it's going to be very hard to transition your clients. When they get a call from somebody else down the street saying, hey, they didn't put you in the right product. This is a better product for you. So I think I think planners have the ability to leave the bank channel. I think people that have the relationships with those clients have the ability to leave the bank channel. I think people that are creative, such as Nick, uh, Know Your Plan, you know, he was very creative with how he wanted to kind of come across to people. So so he was able to take a, 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 a very large percentage. I was able to take 96% uh, of my clients. Um, could I take in more i probably could have um i would you know i'm very competitive I, I i hate the one or two i lost yeah um you know but you know we had i was the top advisor in south florida when i left and they had six advisors that they split my book up with and they had a a very aggressive campaign to try to keep every client with them uh because they didn't want to you know they didn't want to be known as letting their top advisor go taking a, a high percentage of their other of other of clients so um but yeah, I would say know your business, have your clients make sure they know you and, 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 and have that conversation. I, you know, I always had that conversation with clients where I'd said, you know, right now SunTrust is treating me great. If there's ever a minute they're not, I'll let you know. Uh, and, and, and I would pause and kind of wait for their feedback. And occasionally they, they give me that feedback of, you know, well, if you go anywhere, we're going. Or, or they go, you know, well, we'll see. 
I knew the what we'll see is I kind of took as no's and I took the, you know, yeah, you know, we might be interested as yeses. That's great to know. So 2019, you made the transition. So in four years, you've just had monumental growth. Can you just talk about like what that growth was, what what led to it? Um, and if you think you could have done the same thing on the bank channel. It's, it's, well, it's funny. When you leave, you don't think about getting new money from your existing clients. First of all, I had a high percentage of my existing clients assets anyway, but when I left, a lot of times, they would send me the rest of their money going, you know, you're independent now, you can think freely, you're not, you know, uh, you know, shackled by the firm you were with, we're going to give you everything now. We just, we weren't, we were, we were a little concerned that SunTrust, you know, uh, you know, that you had their best interest and not necessarily ours, even though, you know, they, they, they knew that wasn't the answer. Um, but as we grew, uh, we, we started doing our own communications with clients. So our first thing is, is we do a, a weekly video blog that we send to clients, which is kind of just talking about how we see the markets. And the nice thing about being independent is you can do that kind of stuff. You might have to put disclosures at the end that, you know, this is not Raymond James' opinion, this is your opinion, but you were able to kind of speak your mind to your clients for the first time. So I think that uh, was, was great. Um, we, we forward that out to clients. We do uh, client appreciation dinners where our, our, our client appreciation dinners actually in two days from now uh, on Thursday, we have 85 clients coming. You know, we have a, a, a magician, a, a mentalist coming to kind of do, do a fun show for our, for our audience, for our clients. So we do things like that. We send, a, we have these cook, specialized cookie jars we send out to each client that that's interesting. Um, we became, uh, you know, we were with an OSJ at the time when we, when initially signed on, we became our own OSJ. So we brought on some advisors. So right now we have, uh, uh, along with myself, we have five other financial advisors that are part of our team and, and two other support staff. So um, we, we literally grew from just me and, and, and one, you know, assistant to, to actually a brand and, and, and a business within Raymond James. And, uh, you know, we have a turnkey approach here where the advisors own their clients, they own their book, they can brand if they want, they can brand as me, they don't have any controlling aspects, I don't want to have any controlling aspects, but I handle their OSJ responsibilities for them, and, I, and for a couple of them I handle some turnkey stuff, like office space and phones and so on and so forth, uh, and, and support staff. So I think as as we were talking on my podcast about your, your situation, you know, there are people that can go independent that think that going independent means that they have to open up their own office or be their own OSJ. They don't, they can just join a, a turnkey if they so choose, and it makes life easy for those advisors. So we've, we've established into that as well. Um, and our portfolios uh, are, have been doing phenomenal. We've incorporated um, a lot of different alternative investments that have, have done quite well over the last two or three years since the market has not done well. Um, that's, that's been well for our clients. And, uh, and so we get a ton of referrals from our existing client base. That's awesome. And there's definitely a lot to unpack there. I think the first thing for financial advisors to understand is, is that independence just doesn't mean that you're going out and doing every single thing yourself. There's so many different spectrums of independence. And inside of the diff, inside of one broker dealer, you can take multiple hops on a lily pad to get to the destination that you want to. So when you made the transition, maybe you didn't want to deal with office space or marketing, or you just wanted to worry about getting your clients over and keeping them happy. I think a lot of financial advisors don't know that you can be very fluid. And once you get to the critical mass or the comfort level that you want to, then you can make that move over to like being truly independent. But it doesn't need to be all at once and you don't need to rip the Band-Aid off. The, 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 the first thing that you were talking about too, I talked about this with another guy, Sean Till on my podcast. He made a transition from the Wells Fargo Bank to independence and- he was just so shocked by the amount of referrals he got after he made the transition. At the end of the day, I, I really think clients want to root for a business owner. A lot of his clients were business owners and were kind of asking him, you know, you're really successful, man. Like, why are you not, you know, running your own business? Like, look at all of the benefits. And when they, you know, start thinking about it of a business instead of being an employee, I, I really think a lot of referrals come from that. I didn't even hit that hard enough. You're you're a hundred percent right. You 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 work with successful people, entrepreneurs, business owners, CEOs, um, and they value the fact that you're that. They understand that you 
you can help them with their financial plan and how their business looks because you've been in that seat as well. And so I think that does add tremendous value. So if you had a bank financial advisor that, 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 that came up to him today, I know you mentioned the relationship between like the bank and like your value proposition. Like what other questions do you think that they should be asking themselves to decide if this is a good fit or not? Yeah, I, I, I mean, there's a multitude of things. Um, I think, you know, the funny thing about our business is you hear words like planner or, or fiduciary and everybody uses them and they, they get so doled out that people don't truly understand what that means to be a planner um, and, and truly be sitting with clients 90% of the time not talking about investments, but talking about everything else in their life. Um, and how important that is. And so I would say to uh, any bank advisors that are looking to leave, number one, you can, uh, but, but I'm also gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, come back to this. I think there's a lot, a lot of the successful financial advisors that are in the bank channel. And when I, when I say successful, I mean monetarily successful. Um, they don't work as hard as they once did. Um, they tend to, come in when they want to come in and leave when they want to come. I have a lot of friends that are still the top advisors there at SunTrust. And I will tell you the top advisors at SunTrust uh, that were in my area were not the hardest workers, <laughs> you know, four hours a day, you know, maybe they're working the rest of the time they're out boating or they're doing some sort of hobby that they have. Like they're doing something outside of that office and there's nothing wrong with that. So first and foremost, if you're a bank advisor, you're comfortable in doing what you're doing, fine. But if you want freedom and flexibility to be able to communicate with clients, to be able to write them stuff, to be able to talk to them, to be able to, to not feel shackled, to not have to sit on conference calls every, you know, I, I was on conference calls, I don't know how many times a day, three or four times a day, like we're not getting enough referrals for this, or we're not doing this. And, you know, some of the top guys that have been there for 20, 25 years, their books are big enough, they don't worry about it. But I, I, I'm in the, under the belief that if you're not growing, you're dying. And I was, I was in that bank channel and I was growing, but I was also starting to get shackled by all the asks and demands and instead of growing the right way. So I think if you really want to grow, you want to be able to communicate, make sure you have the relationship with your client, make sure you're a true planner, make sure you're not product pushing. Um, and, and you'll know if you have those relationships, if you, if you ask yourself deep down and there has been advisors that I've, I've talked to where after they've met with me, they go, you know what, Evan, I'm not, I'm not there yet. You actually made me realize I'm just not quite there yet. Um, I think that's okay to realize. I think that's an important step in knowing when you're ready. Sure. That's really, really good information. And, you know, one thing that you've mentioned a couple of times that I think not just for bank advisors, anyone at a wirehouse and Edward Jones, you know, somewhere where, you know, the brand is up front and they don't really have the ability to differentiate themselves. Like how powerful communications are. So like I used to be, I used to have another financial advisor and I would get like these capital markets updates from the CIO of their company who like I've never met before. I've never have no relationship with whatsoever. It was in a really volatile time in the market. I was kind of freaking out. And then I'm really good friends with Nick Nielsen. And I get this awesome newsletter from him with like a video in his voice that I know and trust. And he's talking about why things are going to be okay and like why this is built into your financial plan. And just, it just gave me like such a, a sense of calmness versus, you know, hearing from someone that I've never heard of before. And it's just super, super powerful to not only your clients, but your prospective clients to talk about how you're different and your centers of influence. Um, and, and Corey, and how about this? How about, how about not only that, not only hearing the person's voice, but being able to hear something that doesn't sound like it's so scripted that it's been run through compliance 50,000 times. Yeah. Um, or, or, or how about a negative connotation on the market? How about, how about, you know, when you, when you work at some of these firms, it's always positive, positive, positive. And sometimes your clients just need a realist to say, Hey, things are going to be shaky right now. You got to hold on. I mean, this is a roller coaster. Um, I, you know, I think authentic uh, authenticity is huge in this business for, especially the newer generation of, of investors. They, they want to hear from their advisor. They, they, they want the truth. They don't need some buttoned up 
you know, thing that's been run through compliance 50,000 times. Absolutely. Evan, I appreciate the time. I think you gave so many awesome sound bites to advisors considering a transition today. But before we go, though, tell us a little bit about about your podcast. I've, I've been listening to it for a while. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Thanks so much. Yeah, no, it's it's called Four Advisors by Advisors. I did try to get you on when we weren't too big. We couldn't get you yet, so I'm happy we got you now. <laughs> um, I, I remember I was in Austin on some trip, and 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 you ended up on the phone with me, and I think uh, somebody referred to you, but we were just weren't big enough yet, and I I, I get it. Um, but yeah, we're we're we're. Um, I, I got the thought. Um, one day I was actually in a, a swimming pool. My wife had some friends over from college reunion. And one of the guys, the husbands was like, uh, uh, you know, help people create podcasts. And I was like, you know, there's not a podcast out there from an advisor that's not like a $5 million producer. You know, somebody that's, you know, I'm, I, you know, about $2 million production, you know, doing it, but, but, but was there at 500,000 production 10 years ago, right? Yeah. Like knows what, you know, 300,000 production is and knows 500 and, and actually grew there was no shows out there that had an actual uh, financial advisor speaking to other financial advisors that they could relate to. And I, I remember FUBU growing up, if you remember For Us, By Us, the clothes line, I, I said for advisors, by advisors, would it be cool? And I had my, my, my wife's um, company had uh, their, 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 uh, their computer guy create my, you know, my, my, my visual, which is kind of like a Joe Rogan-esque type uh, visual of like, hey, come on my show, we're not gonna be scripted. We're going to talk about the business and we're going to have fun. And there, and, and so uh, we've done about 75 episodes. We actually hit a thousand downloads uh, for this week, which is our, our, our largest num weekly number. Uh, wow. We had our, 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 our largest weekly number two weeks ago and our, our largest weekly number uh, three weeks ago. Uh, so we're, we're, we're moving in a, a really cool direction. I actually almost shut down the show many times because I felt like I talked to everybody. And then occasionally I get like a call from Nick who says, get Corey on and I keep the show going. So it's a, it's really a show for advisors by advisors. We can all kind of share ideas. Um, if you you know, I, I had you know, I'll get people on that have very opinionated thoughts on on how to run their practices, uh, just to hear from them and kind of why are they so opinionated that way. Um, but then we get people on like you that are not necessarily advisors, but can add tremendous value because you speak to advisors day in and day out. Or we get people on from like Riskalyze, or we get people on from from Simon or different softwares that are out there. Um, and it's just a way to educate people that are out there on uh, that are in the business. And, and truthfully, I hope advisors love it. And I hope anybody that tunes into it that's not an advisor hates it because it's not meant for anybody else but for advisors. I love it. I I, uh, I was looking at your most recent episodes um, before this one today. And I'm looking forward to seeing your uh, Andy uh, Panko, Matt Jarvis Smackdown. So I'm going to listen to those on the drive to my meeting today. So um, I really appreciate it. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I, uh, you know, it's funny. They both didn't say anything bad about each other at all. But from what I know, they, I guess they, they do on LinkedIn. And that's the interesting part is they both kind of went on the show and, and I, I thought that, that they would, and they didn't. Uh, so not to, not to, not to uh, share the surprise, but I will say both of them are extremely interesting and they're both opinionated. And, and I think opinionated people in our business are, are, are some of the most interesting people to listen to. Without a doubt. Evan, thank you so much. This is going to be a help for so many people. Um, thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, if, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, you can go to my uh, LinkedIn, Evan Mayer. Uh, you can Google me. You can call You can call our office, 561-430-3399. Ask for me if you're a recruiter. No offense to you, Corey. Uh, we get like 50 a day. Um, so uh, as long as you tell me you're a recruiter, I'll call you back. If you tell me you're, you're my cousin, uh, which has happened on a few occasions, uh, I may not. I already have your cell phone number, so. Yeah, you got, you got me anytime true. you need me, so. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Evan. Have a great day. All right, Corey. You too. Bye.